So I taught you this song two weeks ago when I was here. I just want you to be blessed. Remember that Jesus is the light of the world. So as we sing his name, just remember that and let him just take the burdens of what's going on in the world right now. Just take them away. Just let him shine his light on those and they'll just burn away in his presence.
So I don't know if you guys understand the whole concept of how Calvary Chapel structure works, but Calvary Chapel is made up of a group of churches that started with Chuck Smith many, many years ago. And in the United States, well, although there are thousands of Calvary Chapels around the world, in the United States, they're broken down into regions. So our region, we have come to call it the Deep South region. And we fall under the guidance of Pastor Sandy Adams, who is the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel Stone Mountain. So he is the pastor that we go to for our pastors and leadership conferences. That's the church that we go to our youth conferences, um, our women's conferences are between them and Calvary Chapel Lexington, our men's conference. It is in Calvary Chapel Lexington, but all of us, we kind of fall under Pastor Sandy Adams. So about three weeks ago, Pastor Sandy shared a message that address the things that are going on in the United States right now, specifically with racism and bigotry. So it was so impactful of a sermon, quote unquote, um, that he shared it with all of the regional churches. And a few weeks ago, we as a staff sat through and, and just watched it. And it impacted us so much that we discussed how it was such a timely message and it was so well written and the scripture verses were just so spot on that we thought this is something that everyone at the church needs to hear. And so we prayed about it. We, we talked with Pastor Sandy. He thought it was a great idea. And so he titled his message, Forming a More Perfect Union. And he's going to focus on Micah chapter 6, verse 8. But I want us to really just pay attention to what he says. You know, I think at times we get caught up on just the little things in life. A word that is misspoken, a phrase that's misspoken, and it kind of leads us off into a tangent in the wrong direction. So I want you as a whole to kind of listen to Pastor Sandy's message tonight and be praying that the Holy Spirit would touch you in a way that if there is something in your life that you're doing not right, you know, in the realm of racism or anything like that, that you would make a change, that you would humbly, and I've preached many, many times from this pulpit saying that the Scripture should be used as a mirror. And so tonight's message is just one of those mirrors that we should be looking at, looking at our reflection and then saying to ourselves, is this an area that I need to work on? You know, is there this an area that maybe I ignore in my life and it is an issue that I need to work on? How am I being affected by the things of the world? What's my heart saying when I see the things going on in the world? And so at the end, I'm going to come back up and share a little bit more, but I definitely want us to be focused on that quiet voice that's going to be whispering inside of our hearts, telling us something, you know, and the Holy Spirit is still alive and well. He still speaks to us, and he still tries to get our attention in many different ways. Um, I will say that um, growing up Latino in the United States, you know, over the years, Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult, you know? And so some of us have experienced what he's going to discuss, some of us haven't, you know? But we're all involved in what's going on in the States one way, shape, or form. And so I'm gonna open up, up in prayer. And again, I just want you guys to take this opportunity to really seek what the Lord is wanting to share in your life and maybe it's someone in your life that needs to hear this message as well. And so this is also on the Calvary Chapel Stone Mountain website that you can go to and, and find. And if you can't, call us because we'll help you find it or we'll download it or do whatever it takes for the people who need to hear it to definitely hear it. And so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you that you still give us the opportunity to meet to worship together, to fellowship, and to seek your guidance through your word. 
I thank you for Pastor Sandy and his heart, his heart of leadership for the group of churches that he guides, and also for the heart and the love that he shares for his congregation, as well as how he interacts with us when there is a need in the body that we go to him with. I thank you that he was faithful in preaching this message that we're about to hear, because in times like this, sometimes it's hard to say anything, and sometimes we just stay quiet. But the Lord gave him the boldness, and he was faithful to teach what the Lord laid on his heart. So I thank you for his heart. I pray that each and every one of us would have open hearts to hear from you tonight. Father God, and I do pray that if there are issues in our lives that are touched by this message, that we would radically change. Father God, I pray that you would love us through this, that you would continue to be working in the hearts of everyone in the United States that's struggling, and that in all things we would put our focus and our eyes on you, the one that started it all and the one that should be guiding us all. In your name, O oh Lord, I pray. Amen. 245 years ago, on July 4th, 1776, 13 American colonies declared independence from Great Britain and embarked on a quest for freedom. 11 years later, in 1787, after gaining their independence, our founders conceived a new form of government set out in the Constitution of the United States of America. Our Constitution is one of the truly great human documents in all history along with writings like the Magna Carta, the Mayflower Compact, the Declaration of Independence. It initiated the modern concepts of democracy and a people's right to self-rule. But our Constitution was not a perfect document. Article 1, Section 2 establishes the legislative branch, particularly the House of Representatives. And it reads in part, Representatives shall be apportioned among the states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers. And here's how that number of people is to be counted, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons three-fifths of all other persons. In other words, in the Constitution of the United States, slaves or black people were considered other persons and were counted as three-fifths of a person. This was and is a gross injustice embedded into our nation's founding document. Thomas Jefferson began the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yet Thomas Jefferson himself owned slaves. Apparently to him and many Americans at the time, some men were erroneously considered property, less than a man. Our Constitution's Article 1, Section 2, the three-fifths clause, as it's called, is an ugly stain on our nation's history. Yet understand, the idea of America has always been a work in progress. This is why to take down statues of our founders because they were flawed in their thinking or compromised in some way is to ignore what has always made America great. We are a nation that's still learning. And this is why in our quest for freedom, the greatness of our Constitution is its adaptability. Its preamble wisely states its goal. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Notice the interesting choice of words there in order to form a more perfect union. Today we think of a thing as perfect, we assume that it can't get more perfect. Our word perfect means as good as it can get. But that's not how people in 1787 used the term. Think of the phrase to perfect. Something perfect was something that was being perfected. And over the course of history and time, that thing could become more perfect. That was exactly what was needed when it came to the formation of our country. The Constitution was made to be amended. As needs invariably arose with the shifting of time, 
The Constitution was designed to be amended to meet those needs and improve our union. Thus, the three-fifths clause was made irrelevant with later legislation. Following the Civil War, in the days of Reconstruction, the U.S. Constitution was amended. The 13th Amendment abolished the institution of slavery. The 14th granted citizenship to former slaves and gave to all our citizens equal protection under the law. The 15th gave to former slaves the right to vote. Our Constitution and this quest for freedom called America was adapted and improved. A more perfect union was formed, but work still needed to be done. Despite the deaths of 620,000 Civil War soldiers and three new amendments to our Constitution, injustices against black Americans didn't end. For the next 100 years, local and state governments enacted Jim Crow laws and developed the institution of segregation. Under the promise of separate but equal, blacks were prohibited from the same quality of education and transportation and health care and housing and entertainment. All of life was segregated. There were black and white barber shops, water fountains, restaurants, lunch counters, parks, public toilets. In most towns, there was even a white cemetery and a black cemetery. And interracial marriage was strictly prohibited. In Mississippi, you could be fined $500 and get six months in jail for writing in favor of what was called race mixing. Yet again, the experiment called America rose to the challenge of freedom. In 1954, the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, in which blacks gained the right to attend the same public schools as whites. This gave steam to the civil rights movement, which culminated on July 2nd, 1964, when President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, finally outlawing discrimination based on race and ending segregation in schools, in employment, and in public accommodation. In our day, critics accuse America and the American ideal as being racist and irredeemable. I disagree. Though not perfect and often painfully slow to get it right, America has been and continues to be the world's breeding ground for freedom. Apart from the values articulated in our Declaration of Independence and the flexibility of our Constitution, racial equality would still be a pipe dream rather than the legal reality it is today. In his famous I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King likened racial justice to cashing a check. He said, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American has to, was to fall heir. The note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. But we refuse to believe the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. Dr. King believed that America's values would triumph over its prejudices. He was right in 1964, and he's still right today. Our history, though checkered with failure and success, racism and equality, oppression and emancipation, has made progress, and that progress continues. Four generations after the Civil War ended, Americans elected a black man as president. That alone is an undeniable symbol of progress. We, the people of the United States, are forming a more perfect union. But does there remain work to do today? Absolutely. 
we the people of the United States are still forming a more perfect union. Today, in the wake of the torture and death of George Floyd, peaceful protests are being heard despite violent anarchists trying to drown out the meaningful dialogue. Systemic racism is being exposed. Well-meaning white people are becoming more aware of their own unintentional racism. Pockets of prejudice in law enforcement are being identified and corrected. Where else on earth could these kinds of changes happen so quickly except in America? My point is, is that the United States of America is not the problem. Rather, its ideals are an indispensable part of the solution. But the war with racial discrimination is a long-running battle, and it falls upon every generation to do its part. Despite our progress, racism is an evil thing that hangs on. Why do these human injustices occur again and again? Our persisting problem isn't America or our Constitution. What hinders racial equality lies much closer to home than Washington, D.C. Every person needs to examine their own heart. It seems to me the problem isn't as much a skin problem as it is a sin problem. Racism is born of pride and assumed superiority. And it's not the sole possession of white American bigots. Today, African nations and tribes attack each other and commit mass genocide. The Chinese hate the Japanese. In the Middle East, Arabs despise Jews and Jews despise Arabs. In Ireland, Protestants and Catholics fight with each other. In Muslim countries, Shiites and Sunnis are at each other's throat. India reeks with class warfare. Racism and hatred runs rampant all around the world. The answer lies in what can happen in our hearts. One of the most encouraging sights I've seen are the Christian ministries that are holding services on the street corner in Minneapolis where George Floyd was arrested. You won't hear much about it in the media, but lives are being changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Legislation can mandate racial equality, but through transformation, God's spirit changes people's hearts. In the aftermath of George Floyd's killing, the nation was up in arms. Now, over a month later, it's still up in arms. I know of no one who wasn't horrified by the video of that white police officer's knee on the neck of George Floyd as he cried out, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. You and I saw that, and we wanted to do something. Folks are still angry and want to know what they can do. I find an answer to racial injustice and inequality here in Micah chapter 6. What is it that the Lord requires of you and I? Listen again as I read our text, Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord? and bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? The Hebrew law given through Moses emphasized animal sacrifices. Sacrifice was giving to a cause, it was the giving of my time and my money and my effort for the sake of a cause. And that's what people all over the world have been doing in response to the racial injustices we've seen. Great sacrifices have been made in protest. But sacrifice was not what God required of the prophet. More important to God was Micah's obedience. Earlier, God had said to Samuel, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Often it's easier to give God what I want to give him, sacrifice what's convenient for me, than it is to do for God what God wants done. All God desires of us is simple obedience. I've known people who would rather quit their job, uproot their family, move to a foreign country as a missionary, oh, make great sacrifices, 
but they don't want to break with their tradition and love their neighbor of a different color. It's not sacrifice that impresses God, but obedience. So again, Micah asks, how can I please God? With a thousand sacrifices? With 10,000 rivers of oil? No. Micah answers, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Here's how Micah should respond and show his gratitude toward God. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And these are three simple things that each of us can do to make right racial injustice and to put an end to the divisions that plague our nation. If we want to form a more perfect union, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. First, we should do justly. In our interactions with the people around us, in our treatment of others, even folks not like us, strangers as well as neighbors, we should seek to show fairness and justice. Understand, Christians believe in the Amago Dei. The term means that regardless of skin color and ethnic origin, All humans are made in God's image, the Imago Dei, and God's likeness. The idea of the supremacy of one race over another is foreign to the scriptures. All men are created equal, and they deserve fair and unbiased opportunities. In addition, Christians believe that Jesus died for all men. We know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means that every human you have ever met or will ever meet is a person Jesus died to save. These truths alone reveal the enormous value of each person. Understand how dear this issue of justice is to God. In Deuteronomy 32, his spokesman, Moses, sung to the nation, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Just read the Hebrew prophets, they all call for justice. Isaiah 1 verse 17 shouts, Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Seek justice. Amos cried out in chapter 5, verse 24, but let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Equity and fairness for all people is the longing of our God. Remember how Jesus challenged the religious leaders of his day In Matthew 23, verse 23, the Lord scolded them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. They were so diligent to count out every little grain of spice just to make sure they gave a tenth, no more than required and no less, as if their petty spices were that significant to God. Yet all the while they neglected the issues that God had championed since the beginning of time, as Jesus called them, the weightier matters, bestowing mercy, trusting God, the fair treatment of people. They had majored on the minors and minored on the majors. Phil Taylor was a church kid who grew up in the 1960s. He attended an all-white church in the Deep South. I can identify. Phil writes of his experience, I don't know how we missed it. While King marched on Selma and an entire race cried out for justice, I heard sermons against rock and roll, the Beatles, miniskirts and long hair but I never heard them mention racism 
injustice, intolerance, hatred, and bigotry. Those are the things God hates. A movement for racial justice in America passed Phil like a ship in the night while he and his church pals were focused on trivial pursuits. It's sad that the church has a penchant for missing the forest for the trees. We fail to see the obvious. As Jesus said, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. God, please open our eyes and help us do justly. It's sad that in the wake of the, pro of the protests surrounding George Floyd's death, bad actors and anarchists and political radicals have taken advantage of the tragedy to foster their unrelated agendas. Justice certainly applies to the victims of police brutality, but it equally applies to the business owners who've been looted and innocent citizens who've been physically assaulted in the unrest. We demand justice for George Floyd, but there also needs to be justice for retired St. Louis police captain David Dorn, gunned down while protecting his friend's pawn shop. His senseless death also requires justice. One of the problems with inequity is that it creates anger and frustration and the desire for retaliation. If I'm not being treated fairly, then neither should anyone else. In the struggle for justice, we can be guilty of injustice. In his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King fired up the crowd. He shouted for urgency. Freedom now was his cry. But then he said this. There is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. We must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. In short, don't let your quest for justice become someone else's injustice. This is why God's commandment to do justly comes unattached to any personal or political agendas. With every person I face, in every situation I encounter, God's desire for me is to do what's right. I'm to seek out fairness for people in equity in situations. Can I treat people based solely on their own merits? Can I navigate circumstances unbiasedly and fairly? If I take this calling seriously, it will affect it will affect me in all my ways and in all my days. When I make up the weekly work schedule, I'll be fair to all my employees. I won't play favorites. I won't put my own preferences or prejudices ahead of an employee's performance. I'll do what I promise. I'll show partiality or no, I'll show no partiality in my evaluations. Even more so, to act justly toward people is to avoid snap judgments and harmful stereotypes. Several years ago, a study was done where equal resumes were sent to potential employers. The only difference were the names attached to each of the resumes. Resumes belonging to white sounding names like Greg and Emily got more attention from employers than resumes with black sounding names like Jamal and Lakeisha. Equal resumes, only different names. On the surface, all the employers wanted were good employees. There was no intended racism, yet clearly unjust and bias laden assumptions were made. This is the kind of battle that has to be won in people's hearts. But it's a victory that only occurs when people make a commitment to do justly. Every human being can fall victim to an unconscious bias that we won't break out of apart from a deliberate effort. I think the time has come for some of us to take a stand. 
Doing justly is what we say as well as what we do. Why are some white people willing to let a racist comment at the company party or at the family reunion go unchallenged? Why are we afraid to do justly? What Benjamin Franklin said 200 years ago is still true. Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. Micah says we please God when we do justly and when we love mercy. Don't wait until people deserve love to give love. Some people withhold their love until it's earned and they end up never loving. It's best to be gracious. This too is part of the Imago Dei, that we can love as God loves. When it comes to love, God took the initiative. 1 John 4 verse 19 teaches us, we love him because he first loved us. And now God wants us to take the initiative with other people. To love mercy is to mirror the image of God to other people. It's been said, justice is getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Rather than harbor a grudge, mercy is the willingness to issue a pardon. Mercy is forgiveness. It's the willingness to treat you better than you treated me. To treat you as God treated me. We're never more like Jesus than when we choose to respond to a slight against us with mercy. Earlier this year, Kim Kardashian West visited the White House to appeal to President Trump on behalf of a convict named Christopher Young. Chris is serving a life sentence for a nonviolent drug offense. It was his third offense. And because of the federal three strike law, the judge's hands were tied. Young's sentence was determined automatically by mandatory minimums. But along with Kim, the White House had another visitor that day. Kevin Sharp was the judge who tried Chris Young. And he came to lobby for Chris's release. Judge Sharp is now an advocate for prison reform. He wants to see mandatory minimums abolished. They leave no room for judges to show mercy. Realize our heavenly judge abounds in mercy. God's only mandatory sentence is reserved for those who reject his son. Everyone who confesses their sin and asks for God's pardon is sure to receive mercy. Ephesians 2 verse 4 tells us that God is rich in mercy. We should be thankful that God is rich in what we need most, mercy. He is the God of the second chance. I've heard it said, God's throne is not made of marble, but mercy. This is why he calls it the mercy seat. Sinners bow at God's feet only to find mercy. And this provides an incredible contrast. For today, we live in a cancel culture. Whenever a person makes a comment on social media that flies in the face of the woke opinions of the day, especially if it's perceived as racist or hate speech, they get canceled or nullified. Despite the person's apology or explanation, the offender gets boycotted. There's this mass attempt to strip away their platform and influence. Even their job and livelihood are sometimes threatened. It's a public shaming. And it's the brutal opposite of loving mercy. A big part of helping to build God's kingdom is to create a culture that's forgiving and accepting. One that allows a sinner to start over. A mercy culture. That's what I hope we're building here. Racial justice is important, but it's achieved by changing minds and hearts. And when those people's minds are changed, they need to be extended mercy. And according to Micah, one more command is required of us. We should walk humbly with our God. Humility is understanding and acknowledging my limitations. It's admitting that life is not all about me, that I'm not all that. 
It's me keeping a low profile and it's me placing a high priority on the other people in my life. Holocaust survivor turned Christian leader Corey Tim Boone was once asked if it was difficult for her to remain humble. Corey replied, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey and everyone was waving palm branches and throwing garments on the road and singing praises, do you think for one moment it ever entered the head of that donkey that any of that was for him? If I can be a donkey on which Jesus Christ rides, I'll happily give him all the praise and all the honor. Don't you love that? Humility is remembering that Jesus is in the saddle, not me, and that I'm on a journey to bring him glory. It was the year 1959, at the height of segregation, when a northern journalist, a man named John Griffin, decided to discover what life was like for a southern black man. At first, Griffin thought that he would tour the South as an observer, but he knew that that would limit his perspective. Instead, he decided to literally change his skin color, to actually become black. Griffin took oral medications. He used sunlamp treatments. He dyed the pigment of his skin with various types of stains. Then he traveled through the Jim Crow South and tasted firsthand the horrors of racial prejudice and the plight of African Americans. John Griffin published his findings in a best-selling book entitled Black Like Me. It wasn't enough for Griffin to hear or read about the black person's travails. He wanted to experience them up close and personal. And this is what humility does. It puts people on the same level, on equal footing. It enables black people and white people to come together to learn from each other and to exchange ideas. They begin to talk candidly. Shortly after the current protest started, a former NFL football player, Emmanuel Acho, produced a few videos that he calls uncomfortable conversations with a black man. In his videos, he addresses white people. Acho tries to bridge the gap between a white person's perspective and a black person's reality in America. I don't know much about Emmanuel Acho, so I'm not endorsing him, but so far, he's been helpful. I bring up his videos just to say that these are the kinds of conversations that all white Christians need to be having with their black brothers and sisters. If I read the Bible correctly, the church is called to exhibit racial unity. We are one in Christ. And a primary goal of the church is to demonstrate the ability of the gospel to enable diverse people to live in harmony. And in achieving that goal, understanding and humility go a long way. There are issues involving race to which white folks are blind. You may have had a hard life, but if you're white, I doubt your life was made more difficult because of your skin color. That's not true for most black people. Black folks aren't making excuses, and most that I know don't need any help. But it matters that we care. It matters that all Christians really care for one another. Frankly, to do justly and to love mercy may not be enough if we don't go further and walk humbly with each other and God. Caring and communication is key. Our county, Gwinnett, is now a majority-minority community. No racial group makes up a majority. We are all minorities, and we need to learn to live together. And this is where the church can be a leader. If you're in Christ, you and I have a commonality greater than our differences. With love and understanding, we can work out our conflicts and learn to live as one. Here's my question to each of us this morning. Will we use our platform, however broad or narrow it might be, to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God? Maya Moore's answer to that question is yes. Maya is one of the best women's basketball players to ever play. From Collins Hill High School here in Gwinnett County, 
to the University of Connecticut, on to the WNBA. Maya never had two seasons in a row where she failed to win a championship. She was an MVP and a perennial all-star. Maya is also an evangelical Christian. And for the last two years, she has suspended her basketball career and devoted herself to help a falsely accused prisoner named Jonathan Irons appeal his 50-year sentence. Despite all Maya's success and accolades, she's a humble young lady who has concerned herself with justice in this world and mercy towards a convict. And just this past week, after serving 22 years for a crime he didn't commit, Jonathan Irons was released from a prison in Missouri. He's now a free man, thanks in large part to Maya Moore in the attention she raised. And Irons is grateful. He says he's ready to forgive the man who accused him and sent him to prison. You know, whenever Maya Moore signs her autograph, she adds a Bible verse. It's Colossians 3, verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. She says her mission in life is to know Jesus and make him known. And I love the t-shirt she wore during her interview last week. It quoted Micah 6 verse 8. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. In the same way that Maya Moore is living out her Christian faith, our Lord Jesus is calling us to work for justice in an unjust world, to be an ambassador of mercy, and to focus the lens of our life outward, not inward. I'll close with a line from a poem by civil rights activist Langston Hughes. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where every man is free. America is not yet a fulfillment. It's still a promise. Yet here's how we can fulfill that promise and help make our nation a more perfect union. We can do justly, and we can love mercy, and we can walk humbly with our God. Sobering, huh? So I want to close and ask us to reflect on what Sandy taught when we're going through our closing song. But I want us to remember Micah 6, or yeah, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? I want to ask you three questions that I, I want you to kind of sit on. Are there things in your life that you're allowing that cause division? Division in your home, division in the church, division in the world. Are you doing things that might be giving Christ a bad name? And then the third one is, he said something about minor on the minors, major on the majors. Don't major on the minors. Are we focusing on legalistic issues rather than the love, the grace, and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ? And so I know that the Lord prompted you with something because that's what he does. And so I want us to really focus during this last song. And I pray that whatever he prompted you with, if there are action items that you need to, to work on or to fix, that you don't waste time, that you actually do it. And I want to stress that the Christian walk is never supposed to be done by yourself. You know, we have the accountability of our brothers and sisters here in the room, but I also want to really stress, you know, that Randy and I are always here. Um, we, we take ministry very seriously. Uh, we're always available. But I also can, with a surety, say that the leaders and the elders of the church are also available to you. And so 
if you need prayer, if you need time to process with someone, we count it a privilege and an honor to serve God in the way that we do. And we do make the time for people. No matter how simple you might think it is and, um, or how major you might think it is, we're here for you. And so don't let a day go by where the Lord prompts you to do something or to seek prayer or to seek guidance. Don't ignore it. Just do it. And so I might get in trouble for this. It's a little bold. Don't let pride keep you in your seat. You know, if the Lord prompts you to come up for prayer, I'm going to be up there. You know, several of the elders are here. So come up. If, if I'm with someone, someone else will come up. But if you need prayer, come up and do it. Don't let pride keep you from going to someone and saying, hey, I'm struggling with A, B, and C, and I need prayer, or I need guidance, I need help, I need accountability. Because that's what we're here for. The Christian walk should never be done alone. That's a lie of the enemy. He wants us to believe that we need to be alone in this, and we can do it alone. Because if you ever watch any kind of animal planet thing in Africa, the lion always goes after that lone gazelle that's by itself, doesn't go after the pack. You know, and the enemy wants us to think that we are perfectly okay by ourselves. And that's exactly where he wants us because he's going to consume us and destroy us when we're by ourselves. So I also want to say, and this, these are not empty words. I know wholeheartedly that Randy and I love you guys. You know, we take our calling here at the church very seriously. You know, each and every one of you, we love you. And we are here for you. you know, and anything you need, please let us know. So I'm going to close in prayer, and then we're going to have our song. Dear Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for Pastor Sandy's faithfulness in sharing this message. There was a lot that he shared that um, I think rocks a lot of people's foundations. So I pray that whatever it is that you're doing in each and every one of us, that we would listen and that we would be obedient and that we would follow through with what you're, you're calling us to do. And I do pray that in all things, Father God, we would focus on your love, your grace, and your mercy. And I know I've said this before, but we need to take heart in how Brian ends most services he says, go make Jesus look good. That is something that I think we need to start taking seriously. If we're going to say we're a Christian, if we're going to have the bumper sticker, if we're going to have the t-shirt, then we need to live and walk in a way that glorifies you by our thoughts, our wor words, and our actions. And I do pray for that fresh filling of your Holy Spirit because only in you and only with you can we accomplish the things that we're called to do. And it's the only way that we're going to get through this. So I love you, Lord, and I ask you just to be with us, guide us, direct us, and continue to fill us. In your name, O oh Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen.